This week I was reading a story about a young man who was in love with the farmer's daughter, and he wanted to marry that girl. So he went to her father, the farmer, and he told him, I want to marry your daughter. And the father said, okay, I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage, but you have to do one thing. You have to catch the tail of one of my bulls as it's running at you in my pasture. So he instructed the young man to stand out in the pasture, and sure enough, the first bull comes charging at him, and it's huge, and it's angry. And this young man's thinking, man, this bull's going to kill me. So he jumps out of the way, and he watches that bull and its tail pass him by. Second bull comes up. The only problem is it's even bigger and angrier. (laughs) And this bull is charging at the young man, and the young man jumps out of the way, And he watches that bull and its tail pass him by. Third and final bull. The young man's thinking, this is my last chance. I'm going for it. So the third and final bull comes charging at him. And the young man musters up the courage that he has. And he reaches around to grab the tail. But that third and final bull didn't have a tail. (laughs) How do you think that young man was feeling? If I knew then what I know now, I would have acted differently then. It's called regret. Please turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 13. 2 Kings 13, there's a king who probably felt like that young man full of regret. And my hope this morning is that the Lord uses this passage to be a warning and a challenge to us to not miss out on the opportunities of victory that he desires for his people. So let's get into 2 Kings, verse 1 of chapter 13. It states, In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel at Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. So for context, we have Joash, the, the, the king of the south who became king when he was seven years old, that guy is reigning in the south. And now in the north, the son of Jehu, Jehoahaz, is king. And Jehoahaz, verse 2, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, with which he made Israel sin. And he did not turn from them. So context, this king is not morally neutral. He's leading the people further and further into sin. It's pretty clear that he's following in the way of Jeroboam who led Israel into idolatry and he's continuing that practice. So verse 3, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Wait a second, can God get mad at his own people? In fact, he does. And what does he often do when his children are straying from the path? He does what it takes to get them back on the path. And sometimes he uses something called divine discipline. So the Lord, I think, is using divine discipline with the goal and the intention of their repentance and restoration in the relationship. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He gave them continually into the hand of Haziel, king of Aram, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel. So he's saying that the Lord, in his discipline, is allowing Israel to lose to the Arameans. Verse 4, then Jehoahaz entreated the favor of the Lord. Translation, help. (laughs) And the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Aram had oppressed them. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, so that they escaped from under the hands of the Arameans. And the sons of Israel lived in their tents as formerly. Everything went back to normal. What does that sound like? Doesn't it sound exactly like the book of Judges? (laughs) That Israel strays from the Lord. The Lord brings discipline on them to bring them back. They see the consequences of their sin. They cry for help. Guess what? The Lord raises up a deliverer. Things go back to peace. And you would hope that Israel then looks to the Lord in faith. But what happens? Verse 6, nevertheless, they did not turn away from the sins of the house of Jeroboam with which he made Israel sin, but walked in them and the Asherah still remained standing in Samaria. It doesn't seem like genuine repentance happened. They didn't 
learn from their mistakes, and they didn't turn to the Lord in faith. For the Lord left to Jehoahaz of the army not more than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 footmen, for the king of Aram had destroyed them and made them like the dust of the threshing. That's a really small, decimated army. And then for the next two verses, the text summarizes that Jehoahaz dies, and he has a son named Joash who becomes king. Lest we become confused, Joash, the king of the south, was reigning in the south while another man named Joash was king of the north. There's two different Joashes. There's the child who became king of the south, Joash, and now the second king of Israel mentioned in our passage is the king of the north. Verse 10, in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, also known as Joash from verse 9, the, the son of Jehoahaz became king over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 16 years. So basically, there's two men named Joash reigning, one in the north, one in the south at the same time. And this Joash learned from his father, and he turned from his ways. Or, verse 11 says, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn away from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, with which he made Israel sin, but he walked in them. Almost the exact same wording of verse 2. Like father, like son. Jehoahaz walked in sin, turned away from the Lord. Joash, his son, did the exact same thing. Then the next two verses are a summary that Joash dies and his son, Jeroboam II, is king. But then when we flip to verse 14, it's like going back to this Joash. And for the rest of the chapter, we're going to camp on Joash, the king of the north. And he's the king of the north. Well, Elisha, the prophet, was prophesying and living in the north. And it says, when Elisha, verse 14, became sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him. So even though this Joash was a wicked king, he still recognized that Elisha was the man of God. And he still recognized that the Lord had powerfully worked through Elisha to be a blessing on his nation. So he weeps over Elisha at Elisha's deathbed, and he cries out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. He's identifying Elisha as essentially the most powerful force in Israel. And it wasn't because Elisha was this powerful man. It was because God was working through him. The most powerful force in the nation of Israel was Yahweh, the God of Israel. And it's ironic because that's the exact same wording that Elisha used as his predecessor Elijah was taken up into heaven. And he said, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. It's a sign of respect. So this wicked king is showing immense respect and acknowledging the power of God that was working through this prophet. And Elisha said to the king, take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. So it seems like the prophet is about to teach him an object lesson using a bow and arrows. Then he says in verse 16, put your hand on the bow. And he put his hands on the bow. Then Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. So imagine this scene. The king of Israel is visiting Elisha the prophet on his deathbed. And Elisha says, grab a bow. So the king grabs a bow. And then Elisha puts his hands on the king's hands while he's holding the bow. And he says, open the window toward the east. And he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. So he's shooting this arrow out the window towards the east. Why do you think it was towards the east? Because that's where their enemies were from. The Arameans were towards the east. So he says, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, even the arrow of victory over Aram, for you shall defeat the Arameans at Aphek until you have destroyed them. So we have a very clear and explicit prophetic object lesson. What you just did with my hands on your hands demonstrates that God is giving you victory and he's symbolizing that through the arrow that is going the direction of your enemies. It was pretty clear what the prophet was trying for Joash to understand. God is going to bless you, and it's symbolized by that arrow. 
Now, this is very important, verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows, plural, so there's more. And the king took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. Now, that's a, it's a little funny translation because that word for strike can also mean shoot. I think the word in verse 17 is shoot generally out there, but the word in 18 is strike your target. It's kind of like if you're going to the range, shoot over there, but hit your target. And he's saying hit the ground. Now, it could also mean take your arrows and strike the ground, but it sure seems like with what we just saw in verse 17, he's saying take the bow, shoot the arrow, strike your target, strike the ground. And he struck the ground three times, and he stopped. Hmm. Why do you think it says, and he stopped? Because the author's giving us a clue that he should have kept going. And if we weren't sure of, and he stopped, meant he should have kept going. Look at the next verse. So the man of God was angry with him. And he said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck a ram until you had destroyed it. But now you shall strike a ram only three times. You should have shot more. You missed the opportunity. You only shot three arrows. You, shot a, you should have shot five or six because now the victory that you're going to have is a partial victory. It's a yeah, pretty good victory. But I don't want you to have a pretty good victory. I want you to have a very good victory. I love Elisha's passion. He's about to die. And unlike some in this book, as they're about to die, and the Lord says, I'm going to bring judgment on a later generation. And they say, well, that's okay because it's not going to happen in my life. <laughs> Elisha is angry that the people of Israel are going to miss out on a blessing from God even after he's dead. He cares about the next generation. And he's saying, you had an opportunity. You let it walk right past you. Verse 20, so Elisha died. And they buried him. Now the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year. So now we move to a different thorn in Israel's flesh, thorn in their side. We go to the Moabites who are to the south and the east, and they have these kind of terrorizing, marauding bands. And it says, as they were burying a man, verse 21, behold, they saw a marauding band coming, and they cast the man into the grave of Elisha. So Elisha has already died and has been buried, <laughs> And it's as if they are going to bury this unnamed man and they see this marauding band and they panic. What are we going to do? We got to get out of here. <laughs> so they see that nearby, I would assume, is Elisha's tomb and they throw the corpse into Elisha's tomb. What's kind of funny is this is probably the most forgotten or unknown resurrection in the Bible. Because look in verse 21, as they cast the man into the grave of Elisha, when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. That's called coming back to life from the dead. <laughs> and, and do you think that that news just stayed there with those guys? I mean, if somebody was raised from the dead, I don't care what era of history, that's a big deal, <laughs> right? And I'm sure that the news was spread throughout the land. This guy's corpse hit that guy's corpse, and he was raised from the dead. Who's that guy? The guy that was giving prophetic declarations, speaking as the mouth of the Lord. And who do you think heard about that resurrection? I think King Joash heard about it. And I think he was reminded that God spoke through that man, God worked through that man, and God's going to bring about whatever that man said in the name of the Lord. Sometimes in Scripture we see the Lord authenticating his prophets, authenticating his messengers. Did you know that Elisha performed more recorded miracles in the Bible than any other person except for Jesus? So I think that he was authenticated. <laughs> and when he spoke, you should have listened. And he said, that's the arrow of victory, shoot more. And he only shot three. So verse 22, Haziel, king of Aram, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. That's king number one we learned at the beginning. But the Lord was gracious to them, and he had compassion on them, and he turned to them because they were loyal, faithful followers of him. Because they faithfully went to worship him all the time, and they offered the sacrifices, and they did good deeds for the Lord. That's why God had compassion on them, right? No. In fact, they kind of did the opposite 
and God had compassion on them. Why did he have compassion on them? It says the Lord had compassion on them and turned to them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he would not destroy them or cast them away from his presence until now. Talk about a great verse to understand dispensationalism with Dr. Sam Swisher. God is faithful to his promises, and therefore he will be faithful to his people. God is faithful to his people, and he will do what he says he will do. Verse 24, when Haziel king of Aram died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. And then verse 25 is basically saying there's two fathers and sons here. (laughs) Father, son, Israel. Father, son, Aram. In the first generation, the scales tip towards Aram. (laughs) In the second generation, the, the scales tip toward Israel. But the last line is very important. It says, three times Joash defeated the king of Aram, and recovered the cities of Israel. Why is it important that it says it happened three times? Because he shot three arrows. Because Elisha said, that's all the victory you're going to get. You're only going to get three. You should have shot more. You should have struck more. And as we step back and we think about 2 Kings 13, I think about all of the opportunities that Joash had that he missed. And the arrows were right there in his grasp. Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, says you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't take. (laughs) And it's as if Elisha is saying, every arrow that you shoot, you can't miss. And he didn't shoot them. Why didn't he shoot them? (sighs) And then I think, why don't I shoot them? Why don't we shoot them? Why do we miss opportunities? Warren Buffett says it's good to learn from our mistakes. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> Let's try to learn from Joe Ash's mistakes. Why did he not take advantage of the opportunity that was literally within his grasp? We're not entirely sure, but I, I, I think there could be three main possibilities. One is maybe he didn't recognize the spiritual significance of what was right in front of him. He didn't see it. He didn't connect the dots. He was not spiritually perceptive enough when Elisha says, this arrow represents God's victory for you, now take more arrows. And he didn't see it. And I thought, maybe we miss victories that God is wanting us to have because we maybe don't see them. And why don't we see them? Could we be spiritually distracted? Maybe instead of seeing what the Lord has right in front of us, our eyes are looking at the wrong things. Hmm. Before we can have spiritual victory as a Christian, we need to have spiritual life in becoming a Christian. And how do you receive spiritual life? How do you receive the life of Christ? You trust in him as your savior. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the gift? The gift is restoration, it's forgiveness of sins, it's salvation from Jesus, whose name means the Lord saves. And if you trust in him and the work that he did on the cross, that he shed his blood in your place, that he died, was buried, and raised from the dead, you're clinging and resting exclusively in Jesus and what he's done alone. The Bible says, You are saved. You might call that a victory. We should shout that's a victory, amen? Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest victory we can have is by receiving what Jesus accomplished at the cross for us. But did you know that the victory that he achieved there 
doesn't just have to be a victory we can experience someday. He wants us to have victory now. What does victory now look like? The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph through Christ. He's talking to believers, saying Jesus leads us in victory through him. Well, how do you get victory when Jesus is your leader? When your eyes are focused on him. You know, all of us have something in our life that we struggle with. We all want victory over fill in the blank. Maybe you struggle with anger. Maybe you struggle with bitterness. You just can't forgive. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe there's an addiction. Maybe there's a sin that you just can't get rid of. And the answer starts with and finishes with Jesus. It's not that complicated, but it's really hard when we get distracted. We don't even see it. Listen to this in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who gave us the initial victory and the one who keeps giving us the victory, the one who sustains us. How do we have victory as a Christian? By keeping our eyes on Jesus and allowing Jesus to live through us. Think about Paul in Galatians 2. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. How do I have victory? It's when I allow Jesus to reign and rule. When I see him. And oftentimes we don't see him because we're seeing everything else. It reminds me of Elisha's predecessor, Elijah. One time Elijah was surrounded by an army. He was in the city of Dothan. And his servant is afraid. And he says, don't you see this army around us? And Elijah said in 2 Kings 6, don't fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed. He said, oh Lord, I pray, open up his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Maybe we don't see victory because we don't see Jesus. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. A good place to start is saying, Lord, open up my eyes. Help me to look to you first. What's another reason maybe Joash missed the victory? What's a reason maybe we miss victories? Maybe because we don't believe. Why didn't Joash shoot more arrows? Maybe because he really didn't believe they did anything. I mean, it's one thing when Elisha's got your hand on the bow and he's pulling back with you. I mean, God works through Moses and David and Elijah and Elisha, and he works through all sorts of spiritual people, but does he really want to work through somebody like me? That's called doubting. That's called not believing. You know, one of the biggest ideas in the Bible that we have to get right if we want to experience the victory that God has, is we have to recognize that God is for us. If you don't believe that God is for you, you will never have victory in your life. What does Paul say? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, how can we lose? If God is for us, we will win. We will have victory. And we need to believe that. John says in 1 John 5, that which is born of God overcomes the world. And what has overcome the world? What is the victory that has overcome the world? Our faith. Our faith, not just faith in faith itself. Our faith in Jesus is the victory that overcomes the world. 
throughout life, we've all learned from teachers or coaches or bosses. In my life, I learned a lot through coaches. And one of the, the best things, we've all had good teachers, bad teachers, good coaches, bad coaches, good bosses, bad bosses. One of the things I learned about a really, really good coach is that he made me understand that he was for me. Because when I knew that he was for me, I was free to play hard. I was free to not worry about making mistakes. I was free to go as hard as I could because I knew he was for me. And I think the same holds true with teachers, with bosses. When you know that you have someone that is for you, you will work harder. You will go longer. You will perform better because you know they're for you. And I think, why do we not experience as many victories in our walk with Christ? Maybe we forget that he's really for us. What's another reason why we might miss victories? What's a reason why Joash maybe didn't shoot more arrows? Maybe because he and maybe because we get complacent. Maybe he shot three arrows and thought, three's good enough. <laughs> I shot, I shot, I shot. That's good, right? Three's good. <laughs> and Elisha's like, no, it's not good. You should have shot more. Why didn't you have a tenacity, an intentionality to do more? God wanted to do so much more, and you were content with three arrows. There's a commercial going on all the time, now that it's football season, of a man named Tom Brady. Like him or hate him, undisputed most accomplished football player of all time. I researched this week, there have been 25,000 men who've played in the NFL. Tom Brady is the only one who's won seven championships. Nobody's won six championships. And only one other person has won five championships. It's a pretty exclusive list. And on this commercial, Tom Brady, who just retired from football, is going right back into football. <laughs> he's going from a player to a broadcaster, and he's receiving criticism. They're saying, why are you doing this? <laughs> why not just chill? <laughs> why don't you just go off on a beach and not care? Why don't you just go buy a sports team? Why don't you just quit? And the answer is, that Tom Brady tells to Tom Brady, it's because you live and breathe for football. It's because that's your consuming passion. That reminds me of someone who had a greater consuming passion in the New Testament, a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. His passion was much greater than football. It was about advancing the kingdom of God it was about proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was about giving glory to his Savior. Listen to his own words in Romans 15. He says, thus I made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named. My goal was to go where nobody with the gospel had ever gone before. That was my aim. Another time, he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home, that's alive, or absent, death, to be pleasing to him. What was his ambition? His ambition was to be pleasing to the Lord. Philippians 3, 13, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. I haven't yet arrived. I haven't shot enough arrows. <laughs> I press on toward the goal of of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He wasn't complacent with where he was. He was always hungry for more. You know, Hebrews 9 says that it is appointed for all men to die and after this comes judgment. And Jesus in his teachings is encouraging his followers to have a perspective that when you meet the master, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't think Paul was saying, I've already done enough. Paul was saying, I want to keep going because my consuming passion is Jesus. Walking with Jesus, 
Jesus living through me, Jesus reigning over me, Jesus reaching other people so that they can come to him too. The man at the beginning of our story today, he saw opportunities that passed him by, and he probably was thinking, woulda, coulda, shoulda. But I want you to hear the words of a man who saw, who believed, who was not complacent. The same man we just talked about, Paul. As Paul was about to die, we're going to close right here in 2 Timothy 4. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I'm literally about to die. I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And in the future, there is laid up for me the victor's crown of righteousness. The victor's crown. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What kind of a person is a person who loves when Jesus comes back? The kind of person who loves Jesus. <laughs> what should our goal be? Let's love Jesus. And let's not be satisfied with where we are right now. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would help us to see the opportunities of victory right in front of our eyes. Open up our eyes to see. Lord, help us to believe that you are for us and to act with the courage knowing that you are with us. Therefore, we do not have to be afraid. Lord, may we, be never, may we never be complacent. May we always have an ever-growing desire and love of you and desire for you to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, if there's one this morning who's never trusted in you, Lord, they've never come to the cross with their sins. I ask, that if you want to trust in Jesus, you can do so right now with me in your heart, genuinely coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, I am a sinner and my sins are a big deal and I'm guilty in your sight. But I realize my sins have separated me from you and I cannot do anything to earn your forgiveness. There's nothing I can do. There's no amount of righteous deeds I can do to receive your forgiveness. But I believe when your word says that your son is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who makes our sins as far as the east is from the west, that when he shed his blood on the cross, he was my substitute, that you saw his blood and you said, your sins are paid for. Lord, I trust in your son, Jesus. I believe that when he died on the cross, he made the full once and for all time sacrifice for my sins, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead, and that because of his victory, I have victory for eternity. Lord, help me to live in that victory today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.